What is good, Horror Horde? This is your boy, Horror Gamer, back with another video for you. And as you can tell by the title of this video, this is the epic finale of the first season of Horror Gamer Reads. And if you haven't seen any of them, we have been reading Resident Evil Volume 1, The Uns uh, Umbrella Conspiracy. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm excited about this book i'm excited about this ending that we're about to get into this epic finale i'm so excited about it yet i'm sad too because we, man this book has given us some awesome awesome times and it's going to be sad to be done with it but you know what we're just going to move right on to the next so all right horror horde with all that being said without any further ado let's just jump right into the epic conclusion of resident evil volume one the umbrella conspiracy this is going to be good. Oh, I can't wait. <clears throat> Chapter 19. Jill stared in astonishment as Wesker suddenly stopped talking and crumbled to the floor, and Barry stepped into view, staring down at Wesker's body with a look of intense hatred, Colt in hand. Beret <clears throat> she crouched down next to Wesker and pried the Beretta from his fingers, tucking it into her waistband. Barry turned to look at her, his eyes swimming with apology. Jill, I'm sorry. I never should have believed him. Jill stared at him for a moment, thinking about his daughters. Maria was Becky McGee's age. It's okay, she said finally. You came back, that's what matters. Barry handed her back her weapons, and they both gazed down at Wesker's sprawled form, still breathing but unconscious. He was out cold. I don't suppose you have any handcuffs on you, Barry asked. Jill shook her head. Maybe we should check out the lap. There's bound to be some cable or cord we can use. Besides, I'm kind of curious about this miracle of modern science he was talking about. She turned and found the switch that operated the hydraulic door, noting the biohazard symbol painted across the front. The door slid open and the two of them stepped inside. Well, it was a huge, high ceiling chamber lined with monitoring consoles, cables sna snaking across the floor, and connecting to a whole series of standing glass tubes. There, was <clears throat> there were eight of the tubes lined up in the center of the room, each of them big enough to hold a grown man. They were all empty. Barry reached down and scooped up a handful of cable digging into his pocket for a knife while Jill walked toward the back gazing at the technical and mechanical or medical equipment and stopped staring feeling her jaw drop against the back wall was a much larger tube at least eight or nine feet tall hooked up to its own computer console and the thing inside filled it top to bottom it was monstrous Jill I got the cable up Barry stopped next to her, his words faltering as he saw the abomination. Silently, they both walked toward it, unable to resist a closer look. It was tall, but pre predominantly correct. Oh, I'm sorry, proportionally correct. <clears throat> At least through the broad muscular torso and long legs. Those parts appeared human. One of its arms had been altered into a cluster of massive dragging claws hanging past its knees while the other seemed ordinary. The over, it was if overly large. There was a thick bloody tumor protruding from where the heart would be and Jill realized staring at the bulbous mass that it was the thing's heart. It was pulsing slowly, expanding and contracting in slow rhythmic beats. Ooh, they found the tyrant. She stopped in front of the tube, awed by the abomination. She could see lines of scar tissue snaking across the limbs, its surgical scars. It had no sexual organs. They'd been cut away. She looked up at its face and saw that parts of the flesh there had also been removed. The lips were gone, and it seemed to grin broadly at her through the sliced red tissue of its face all of its teeth exposed. Tyrant, Barry said quietly. 
Jill glanced over at him, saw him frowning down at the computer that was hooked to the tube by multiple cables. She looked back at the tyrant, feeling nearly overwhelmed by pity and disgust. Whatever it was now, it had once been a man. Umbrella had turned him into a freakish horror. We can't leave it like this, she said softly, and Barry nodded. She joined him at the console, looking down at the mirrored switches and buttons. There had, there had to be a switch that would put an end to its life. It deserved that much. There was a set of six red switches in a row along the bottom of Barry, and Barry flipped one of them down. Nothing seemed to happen. He glanced at her, and she nodded for him to continue. He used the side of his hand to flip all of them. There was a sudden dull thump. They both whirled around, saw the tyrant pull back its human hand, and hit the glass again. Cracks webbed out from the impact, though the glass had to be several inches thick. Oh shit! Barry grabbed her arm as the creature drew its bleeding knuckles back for another blow. Run! They ran, Jill wishing to God that they left it alone, panic welling up from deep inside of her. Barry slammed his hand down on the door control and it slid open as behind them glass shattered. Oh shit, you all found the tyrant, yo, what's up? They stumbled through the door, terrified, Barry hitting the lock, and saw that Wesker was gone. Son of a bitch. Wesker stumbled toward the power room, his head pounding, his limbs feeling strangely distant and weak. He felt like he was going to throw up. God damn, Barry. They'd taken his gun. He'd come to as they walked into the lab and reeled toward the elevator. Cursing them both cursing Umbrella for creating such a screwed up mess, cursing himself for not simply killing the stars when he could have. It's not over. I'm still in control. This is my game. The sample case was down in the lab, probably being destroyed right now by one of those idiots. Tyrant, too. That magnificent creature, powerless without the all adrenaline injections. Dead, they'd shoot him in the sleeping heart. He'd die without ever tasting battle. Wesker reached the door to the room and leaned against it, struggling to catch his breath. Blood dribbled out of his ears and he shook his head, trying to clear it of the strange fog that had settled into his brain. He didn't have the tissue sample, but he could still complete his mission. It was important, very important that he complete his mission. It was about control, and control was his game. Triggering system, watch out for monkeys. The MA-2s he had to be careful. Wesker opened the door and pitched forward, the ground seeming to, too far away and then too close. The machines were hissing at him, whining and hissing in the hot, oily air. His hand found the railing, and he pulled himself toward the back of the room trying to hurry but finding that his legs weren't interested. A claw shot down from above and tore into his scalp, yanking away a clump of his hair. He felt warm liquid trickle down the back of his neck and stumbled on, the pain in his head is sharper now. Oh boy, he's about to get what he deserves, I'm telling you that. Took my gun. Stupid, stupid assholes took my gun. He reached the door and had just managed to get it open when something heavy landed on his back, knocking him to the next room. He fell on the cold metal floor and a terrible shriek sounded in his ear. Thick talons punctured the skin on his back and Wesker slapped at it, at the grinning, screaming thing that was trying to kill him. He hit the creature as hard as he could, shoving the heel of his hand into its throat. It leapt away, landing on the mesh wall and clambering back up to the ceiling. Wesker pulled himself up and stumbled on. Fresh waves of pain and nausea washed over him. The air was too hot. 
the turbines loud and relentless in their spinning, throbbing frenzy, but he could see the door to the back now, the door that led to the completion of his mission. All of the stars dead, blown up, blown into orbit, while I escape, fly away a rich man. He flung the door open and made his way toward the small, glowing screen in the back corner. It was quieter here, cooler. The massive machines that filled the chamber hummed softly at him, their purpose quite different than that of the one outside. These were the machines that wanted to help him regain his control. The noise from the open door behind him seemed far away as he reached the glowing screen, his fingers numb as they touched the keyboard beneath. He found the keys he needed, the code spilling out across the monitor in soft green after only a few mistakes. A sexy quiet voice informed him that the countdown would begin in 30 seconds. Dizzy, he tried to remember the setting for the timer. The system would trigger automatically in five minutes, but he had to reset it, give himself time to get reoriented and make his way back to the outside. Behind him, something screamed. Wesker whirled around confused and saw four of the mesh monkeys running at him, lashing out with long curved hands as they reached him. Terrible pain shot up through his legs and he fell, crashing to the hard steel floor. This can't happen. One of the creatures jumped onto his chest and suddenly Wesker couldn't breathe. He couldn't even raise his weak arms to push it away. Another tore into his left leg, ripping away a thick chunk of flesh with its hooked claw. The third and fourth screamed in savage glee, dancing around him like little dark vicious children, lifting their claws as they pranced on squat legs. Somehow there was blood in his eyes and the world was spinning away, screams and hisses and incredible searing heat blurring his vision, his mind. Tyrant has come. Wesker could feel it, could feel the presence of something vast and powerful touching him. Grinning through the pain, he searched for it through the red haze of his failing vision, wanting more than anything to see it slaughter his attackers in a glory of perfect motion. But he could only make out the immense shadow that seemed to flood over him. Through him, could only imagine that the powerful, magnificent warrior was reaching down to lift him from his torment. I control, let me see. Darkness stole his hopes away, and Wesker thought no more. Well, bye-bye, Wesker. That was it. I guess the tyrant reached down and fucking stabbed him with his talon and killed him. Whew, that was a... That was a fitting end to old Wesker, wasn't it? Stars Alpha Team, Bravo, anybody. If you can't answer, try to signal. I'm running out of fuel. Do you read? This is Brad. Repeat. Stars Alpha Team. Rebecca hit the button, talking fast. Brad, there's a heliport at the Spencer Estate. You have to get to the heliport. Brad, come in. There was a high whining squeal, and Rebecca heard what must have been the word copy, but the rest was lost. I copy, or do you copy? There was no way to know. Frustrated and worried, Rebecca held onto the radio tightly, hoping that he'd heard her. Suddenly, a shrill alarm blared into the silent room through some hidden speaker in the ceiling. Rebecca jumped, star staring around the cold chamber helplessly. There was a buzzing click from inside the door that led to the heliport and hurried over, grabbing the handle. She hurried over, grabbing the handle and pulling it open. It had unlocked. Ooh. A cool female voice began to speak slowly and clearly over the jangling alarm. The triggering system has now been activated. All personnel must evacuate immediately or process deactivation. You have five minutes. The triggering system has now been activated. 
As the recorded message repeated, Rebecca stood in the open doorway and watched the open ladder shaft. Her blood racing, waiting to see Chris emerge from the levels below. He'd only been gone a few minutes, but their time had just run out. Oh boy, this is getting good. Oh boy, this is getting good. Whew. Here we go. Chapter 20. Jill and Barry ran from the elevator back toward the main hall of B3, the cool voice informing them that they had four and a half minutes. They hit the open corridor at the dead run, sprinting around the corner, and saw Chris Redfield halfway up the metal stairs. Chris, Jill shouted. He spun around, his face lighting up as he saw them dashing toward him. Hurry, he shouted. There's a heliport on B1. Thank God. Chris waited until they reached the base of the stairs and then ran ahead, rushing around the walkway and holding open the door that led to the ladder. Jill and Barry made it to the top and sped through, the computer telling them that they had four minutes, 15 seconds to get away. Barry went up the ladder first and Jill followed, Chris right behind. They piled out into B1. Jill saw that Rebecca Chambers was standing at the emergency exit, her youthful face tight with anxiety. Chris hustled her through the door, and the four of them ran through a winding concrete hall, Jill praying silently that they'd have time to clear the estate. I hope you burn here, Wesker. There was a large elevator at the end of the corridor, and Barry slammed the gate open, holding it as they rushed inside. He jumped in after them. They had four minutes even. The elevator seemed to crawl upward, and Jill looked at her watch, heart pounding as the seconds ticked past. Not going to make it. We'll never make it. The lift hummed to a stop, and Chris yanked the gate open, the cool air of early morning sweeping over them, and the sweet, wondrous sound of a helicopter overhead circling. He heard me, Rebecca shouted, and Jill grinned, feeling a sudden wave of affection for the rookie. The helicopter port was huge, the wide, flat space surrounded by high walls, a circle of yellow paint on the asphalt showing Brad where to set down. Barry and Chris both waved their arms frantically, signaling the pilot to hurry as Jill looked at her watch again. A little over three and a half minutes remained, more than enough time. Crash! Jill whirled around, saw chunks of concrete and tar fly into the air and rained down over the northwest corner of the landing pad. A giant claw stretched up from the hole, fell across the jagged lip, and the pale, hawking tyrant leaped out onto the heliport, rose smoothly from its agile crouch, and started toward them. Oh, God! What the hell is that? It had to be eight feet tall, parts of its giant body mutated and deformed. Its grinning face focusing on them, even as it stood up, it moved toward them at a slow walk, the massive claw on its left arm flexing. No time. Brad can't land. Chris targeted the dark, tumorous thing on its chest and fired, pulling the trigger five times in rapid succession, three of the rounds finding their mark. The other two were within an inch of the pulsating redness, and the creature didn't even slow down. Scatter, Barry yelled. The stars split, Jill pulling Rebecca to the furthest corner from the towering monster. Chris sprinting toward the southern wall. Barry stood his ground, pointing his colt at the approaching beast. Three 357 rounds slammed into its belly, the thundering shots echoing against the high concrete walls. The creature suddenly sped up, running toward Barry, drawing its giant claw back. And as Barry dove out of the way, the thing swept past him in a running crouch, bringing its claw up as it's, if throwing a ball overhand. Its talons gouged the asphalt, ripping through it as though it was no more solid than water. As soon as the monster was passed, it stopped running turning almost casually back to watch Barry scramble 
to his feet and fire again. The bullet took out a fleshy chunk of its right shoulder. Thick blood coursed down its wide chest and joined the dripping open mass of its stomach. Overhead, the Alpha's copter still circling, unable to land, and there was still no sign that the immense creature felt the injuries. It started to run again, dropping its terrible, inhuman hand down as it went for Barry. Just as he, just as his revolver clicked on empty, Barry sprinted away, but the charging monster veered with him, and its swiping call glanced against his side, tumbling him to the ground. Barry! Chris raced toward the creature, firing into its back as it bent over the fallen Alpha. Barry was scrambling backwards, his vest shredded, his eyes wide in terror and it must have felt the sting of the bullets because it turned, fixing its emotions, fixing its emotionless stare on Chris. Barry staggered to his feet and limped quickly away. We don't have any time. Chris emptied the clip, the last several rounds hitting it in the face. Pieces of tooth flew from the creature's lipless mouth, spattering to the asphalt like Spattering in, spattering to the asphalt in a rain of white and red. The creature didn't seem to notice as it started to run toward him at an incredible speed. Jill and Rebecca were both firing, shouting, trying to turn its attention away from Chris, but it was already fixated, pounding toward him and drawing its claw back. Wait for it. He dove to the side at the last possible second, and the monster went flying past, its claw mulching the asphalt where he'd just been standing. Chris ran, the horrible awareness dawning on him that the seconds were slipping past and they couldn't kill it in time. Barry felt blood escaping from his thigh, the top several layers of his skin sliced neatly away by the tyrant's brutal swipe. The pain was bearable. The knowledge that they were going to die wasn't. We'll blow up if we don't get chopped to pieces first. Tyrant turned its attention to Jill and Rebecca, both of them firing again at the seemingly invulnerable monster. It started its smooth, easy walk toward them, still indefinite to the bloody holes in its body. Shotgun blast hit it in the legs and chest. Nine millimeter bullets speckled its pasty flesh and it didn't falter, kept on walking. Wind whipped down over Barry as the roar of the helicopter's blades suddenly got louder. He heard a screaming shout come from above. Incoming! Barry stared up at the copter hovering only 20 feet from the ground and saw a heavy black object fly out of the open door on the side, hitting the tar with an audible thud. Chris was closest. He ran for it. The tyrant had almost reached Jill and Rebecca. The two of them split, each headed in a different direction, and the creature turned toward Jill without hesitating, tracking her with its strange, fixed gaze. Jill, this way, Chris screamed. Barry spun and saw that Chris had the bulky rocket launcher propped on its sh- on his shoulder. Yes. Jill veered toward Chris, the tyrant close behind. Clear. She leapt to one side and rolled as Chris fired. The whoosh of the rocket propelled grenade almost lost the thundering beat of the copter's r- rotors. The explosion wasn't. The grenade hit the tyrant square in the chest and in a burst of incendiary light and deafening sound, it blew the monster into a million smoking pieces. Even as tattered shreds of flesh and bone hailed down over them, Brad lowered the copters back toward the ground and the four stars ran for it. The rails hadn't touched yet as Jill dove into the open cabin 
Chris and Rebecca and Barry all throwing themselves in after her. Go, Brad, now, Jill screamed. The bird lifted into the air and sped away. Chapter 21 The calm female voice fell only in the calm female voice fell only on in human ears. You have five seconds. Three, two, one. System activation now. A circuit that ran through the length and width of the estate connected. With an earth-shattering thunderclap of motion and sound, the Spencer estate exploded. Devices went off simultaneously in the basement of the mansion beneath the reservoir behind a plain intersecting fireplace in the guardhouse and in the third level of the basement laboratories. Marble walls tumbled down over the disintegrating floors of the fine old mansion. Rock collapsed and concrete blew into the fine blackened dust. Massive fireballs rose up from rose up into the early morning sky and could be seen from miles away in their few brief seconds of brilliant life. As the incredible peal of booming sound rolled across the forest and died away, the wreckage started to burn. Oh. Epilogue. The four of them were quiet as Brad piloted the copter back toward the city. And though he had a million questions, something about their silence didn't invite conversation. Chris and Jill were both staring out the hatch window at the spreading fire that had been the estate. Their expressions grim. Barry was slumped against the cabin wall looking down at the hand at his hands like he'd never seen them before. The new girl was quietly moving among them, treating their wounds without saying a word. Brad kept his mouth shut, still feeling crappy about taking off earlier. He'd been through hell since then, flying around in circles and watching the fuel gauge slowly drop. It had been a total nightmare, and he had to take a piss like nobody's business. And then the monster. He shuddered. Whatever it had been, he was glad it was dead. It had taken all of his nerve not to fly away the second time he laid eyes on it. And as far as he was concerned, he deserved a little consideration for managing to kick the launcher out the door. He glanced back at the silent foursome, wondering if he should tell them about the weird call he'd gotten over the radio, right after the rookie had screamed something about a heliport through the static. A clear, solid signal had come in, a male voice calmly giving him the exact coordinates. The guy had been listening in which was weird, but the fact that he knew the location well enough to give Brad directions was downright spooky. He frowned, trying to remember the mystery, the mystery man's name. Thad, Terrence, Trent, that's it. He said his name was Trent. Brad decided that it would Brad decided that it would keep for another day. For now, he just wanted to go home. The end. Holy shit, Horror Horde. I mean, wow. Like, this book was epic as hell. Um, I mean, it had everything. It had the scares. It had... You know, familiar faces. It had that feel, like when they were in the mansion when they first got there. The claustrophobia. It had it all. The only thing it was missing, unfortunately, um, was it was missing the scene with um, Lisa Spencer. Is that her name? 
Not Lisa Spencer. What the hell is her name? Lisa Trevor. Lisa Trevor. It was missing the scenes with Lisa Trevor. Wow. You know, it didn't get deep into it. Lisa Trevor in the remake of the game is a really big, like, character. And her story is definitely heartbreaking. Now, they do mention her dad in it and everything. And they do kind of, like, give a little bit of an insight. But in the game, she's more of a villainous character. So, unfortunately, we didn't get to relive that in the book. But all in all, this book is insane. And I'm so glad that we were able to read it together. And I'm so glad that I purchased this. And I'm so glad that it was it was good. It was such a good book. I, I'm just really happy with it. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed reading it for you. If I'd have to give this book a score, I'm definitely going to have to give this a 10 out of 10. But no, no, let me rephrase that. I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10. Because like I said, it missed the parts with uh, Lisa Trevor. But other than that, and other than the fight scene with the snake... Uh, it was a damn good book. I definitely recommend you guys check this book out. Um, you can get it on Amazon. Or if you don't want to read it, just go back and watch the watch the read-throughs we did together. So, um, Resident Evil Volume 1, The Umbrella Conspiracy. Definitely Horror Gamer approved. And I really hope you guys enjoyed the finale. This is season one, the finale of Horror Gamer Reads. We definitely had a good book. Now, starting next week, we're going to jump right into season two of Horror Gamer Reads. And we're going to dive into Resident Evil Volume 2, Caliban Cove. And this looks like it's going to follow Rebecca. So we're going to see. Um, I don't know, like... In the video game world, after the uh, mansion incident, we have the uh, Raccoon City incident. So, this doesn't have anything to do with Raccoon City, but we're going to see. We're going to see. We're going to definitely check this out. we got some good reading ahead of us now. So, definitely looking forward to Resident Evil Volume 2, Caliban Cove, um, starting next week. So, all right, Horror Horde. With all that being said, thank you guys. I love you guys. I really hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed reading it. Such a good book. Such a such a good book. I'm so glad we got to do this together. All right, Horror Horde. With all that being said, I love you guys. Thank you guys. And don't forget, if you haven't done so yet, hit that subscribe button along with that dingly ding ding button. Every, every time your boy Horror Gamer throws up one of these epic Horror Gamer reads that you're in the know. All right, Horror Horde. With all that being said, I love you guys. Thank you guys. And until next time, this is your boy Horror Gamer saying, as always, don't fear the darkness embrace it and get ready for horror gamer reads season two next week i'm out